Hi, this is Nancy L.T. Hamilton. Uh, welcome back to my little uh, school of hard knocks. Um, today we're going to be making chasing tools, and it's a pretty dirty, extensive uh, job, but um, it's an invaluable skill that I think you should know. Um, so what we're going to do first is talk about the material that we're working with. I also want to recommend um, three items. They're not all books. Two are books. One's a CD. Uh, one is the Chasing a Red Pose book by Megan um, Corwin. Nancy Megan Corwin. I don't know why I keep calling her Megan. Because she share, stole my name, maybe. And then the Complete Modern Blacksmith. And then um, Charles Luton Brain's uh, Lost Book series. Um, and he has a lot of, lot of, I mean, so much information on the whole art of chasing a repose as well as making tools. So we will start on the uh, discussion about steel. So steel is a very strange beast. It has a lot of different states that it goes into depending on the temperature that it's being treated with. In the case of making our tools, it's going to go through three different stages. The first one would be annealing, and the reason we do that have an annealed soft metal is so that we can shape the tool into what we want it to be. The second step is where the steel becomes, we harden the steel so that it has strength. Um, but if you try to use the steel just harden, it's very, very brittle. So if you hammered it on the end of it, there's a great potential for it to, to shatter. It's just, it's that brittle, brittle. The third stage that we go through and the steel changes once again, is um, called tempering and in the tempering process we're softening the metal up not as much as annealed um, but not as hard as when it's hardened so that it ha retains a form of springiness and some give but still has the strength so there's all kinds of different terms for the stages it goes through like austenite and marts martsonite and perlite and all that um, so I'm probably not going to talk about that too much since I'll forget half of it, but I will eventually have this on my website. Um, so that's a little bit about the steel. The next thing we're going to discuss is um, what do you need to buy? So the, the deal with <clears throat> whether to buy square or round stock is, um, is the tough one because some people say that the square stock helps you find the center uh, while you're hammering, but the square stock gets uh, uncomfortable in your hands <clears throat> after a bit of use. Um, you can always twist the square stock to make it round like this. Not round. Have a little more grip and less bite into your fingers. You can also um, purchase um, a product. Oh god, I hate to do this. But I'm going to like this stuff called Subaru, which is a soft, uh, rubbery plastic that makes great grips. Come in little packs like this. And you can wrap that around your tool. It takes 24 hours to set. Um, so that's another option for comfort because if you're holding these tools for hours, your hands are going to get sore. And especially with this bigger rod, it's going to really bother your hands. Um, <clears throat> Let's go on to size. So anyway, round round is more comfortable. Certain tools are more, you know, like more usable in certain instances if they're round. Like this is a, a masonry nail that I made into um, a repoussé tool. Um, you know, I, I don't, I personally don't see a big deal. As long as you've got something wrapped around the, the square rod, I think it works fine. Um, so anyway, those are the two kinds you can get. You can get um, bar stock, which is the square, or you can get the, um, what the heck, I just said it and I totally forgot, drill rod. That's <laughs> so I'm showing you here two of the extremes. I don't think you want to get any smaller than this one. This is a 1 8 inch. And between the 1 8 we've got, let's see, what do we have here? We have 1 8 we have 3 16 1 quarter, 3 16 5 16 and then this is 3 8 I, I doubt you're going to need anything bigger than this. This is a pretty hefty rod here, and I would probably make a, I'm, I know I'm making a repoussé tool out of 
out of this uh, um, and upsetting the edge and making a rounded one. So generally what I use for um, my tools is 3 16th one corner and uh, 5 16th are most of my tools in that range there. So the deal is when you buy it, and oh by the way, these are from onlinemetals.com um, and they come in three foot lengths and they're just like a couple bucks a piece. They're really inexpensive, especially when you compare them to buying chasing and repose tools, but the work involved is um, where, you, where the money comes from, why the tools are so expensive. Um, so if you're going to make tools, set aside a day and make a whole bunch of them so you don't have, you know, it's just more efficient that way. Or make one at a time. It's up to you. Uh, who am I to tell you what to do? Yeah. So um, the next thing we're going to talk about is the um, uh, softness. When you purchase from, from suppliers, most of these steels come annealed already which is great so you don't have to do that but you need to be able to check um, if you have some old steel laying around you need to be able to check to see if it is annealed or not and I will just I will set up to show you how to do that now so for this process you need to have steel dedicated tools you do not want to use your good files on steel because they can wreck them so get some crummy ones from the junk store or your older ones and use. Um, so anyway, on, God, I gotta stop saying. So on to testing. So <laughs> I did it again. Ah! Now we are going to test um, for annealedness. Now this one I know is annealed, but what you're looking for is you're gonna run your file along an edge. And if it feels like the file doesn't have any teeth, that means that the, it, the steel is hardened. If it bites and cuts into the steel, that means it's annealed. So annealed equals workable, and hardened means no, <laughs> not workable. Um, here's a piece that is hardened, and you can hear the difference. It's just not the same. You know, this is biting. This is biting in and actually cutting the steel. All well, this air filing I'm doing here, and you can actually see that the edge has been beveled a little bit by the file. So that's the big test for determining whether your tool, your steel, is um, annealed or not. You'll also find out if you're trying to saw it. Um, you will be like, eh, 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 and nothing's happening. <laughs> you pretty much know that you have. Um, hardened steel and not annealed steel. So what we want is the annealed for the first part. So in the stages of the tool making we have the um, annealed state, we have the tempering, the hardening state, and then we have the tempering state. In the hardening state the steel is heated hot and then cooled quickly um, and each steel has a specific way that it has been designed on how it needs to be cooled. So the steel that I got from OnlineMetals.com is water-cooled steel, which means in the hardening phase it will be quenched in water. Now the steel that we want for tool making has 1% carbon, ideally. Um, you don't want to use a mild steel, and I will show you a test to tell the difference between the two in a minute. Um, but this little chart I made up shows you um, what you're looking for. If you see a W1 steel, that means that it is water quenched or cooled and is 1% carbon. O1 is oil quenched. A1 is air cooled. All They'll all have the one after it and that signifies the percentage of carbon that's available in the steel. And that's what we want. Um, most steel is composed of many different elements depending on its use as this little chart I made showed. Um, but our big concern here is the, the presence of the carbon. So next we're going to, I'm going to show you how to cut and size, or size and cut, your steel. So to determine the size that you're going to make your tools depends on the size of your hands. Um, Charles Luton Brain has this little technique which I think is pretty dang snappy. Um, what you do is, see this Part right, I love it. I'm gonna write with Sharpie. See where this finger joins my hand? And see where my thumb joins my hand? 
what we're going to do is measure this distance from here to here, which I will do right now for you. So uh, mine's about two and a quarter inches, and you divide that by three. So I'm going to just do this by eye because I'm not going to do math on live again. It's too embarrassing. So I'm going to say maybe here and here, right? Third, one, two, three. So we got. So I want my tools, actually this should be up here. I want my tools to come from the tip of my finger to right here, which is going to be two thirds the distance between here and here. So let's see. So it's a little short, but it's dang close. So that's approximately how long you want your tools. Um, another way is if you buy them commercially, if they feel too long, then don't buy that size again. Um, I like mine about three and a half inches long. You can make them three if you've got smaller hands, four if you've got bigger hands. Um, but you can try this trick. And I do have it on my website under Chasing Right Jose, the little chart with hand and everything. So now what I'm going to do is just mark three and a half inches down my stool, stool down, <laughs> down my shank of my steel, steel st tool steel. Oh my God, tongue twister, too much alliteration. So I would mark this all the way around and then draw a line so that I've got a nice line all the way around. Because when I saw this, um, I'm going to be sawing from all sides. So I'll be like that. Um, use, like depending on the thickness of the steel, um, I would use an aught blade, zero, or even a, a one, not aught, one aught. But, you know, you want a pretty... Well, you can't see the teeth on here, I doubt, but you want a pretty hefty blade for sawing through the steel. And um, you definitely want to use some lubrication on your blade. And this is liquid burlife that I apply with a paintbrush. So after this is all marked out, then I'll go ahead and either use a cutoff disc, which is another option, is to use cutoff disc to cut this, but wear, definitely wear a mask, or to use um, a handsaw. Um, you can also use a hacksaw, but the jeweler saw works fine for me. Um, and when you are almost sawn through, you can snap it off by putting it in your vise. And I'm, I'm just going to use, I'm not going to do this because I don't want to. But let's say it's sawn to right about here. So I'm going to just put it in there and then I'm going to take my hammer and whack it, not towards me. <laughs> you know, I would probably whack it that way. And it should snap off if you've sawn through enough on um, all around the edges. So that's a shortcut so you don't have to saw all the way through. But on this thinner stock, it's really, it's not that big a deal if the metal's annealed. If it isn't annealed, you'll know it. But you will be not happy. So um, that's how to saw it. By the way, when you buy the steel stock, I. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't get anything longer than three feet because this is hard enough to deal with. Um, some of it's sold in six foot, 20 foot lengths. You try imagine trying to saw off a little three and a half inch piece off of a 20 foot rod. So buy manageable sizes um, for your ease and comfort. So I'm going to show you the test for mild steel and or carbon steel right now. Here I'm all dressed up. I'm going to be on the grinding wheel and I got my hair up and my goggles on. Normally if I'm working here I would wear a mask but I'm going to only be one second here so I'm going to risk my lungs. Um, before you turn on your grinding wheels you, sh you should not stand in front of it just in case the wheel's cracked and as it starts to spin if it is cracked it can fly off and kill you. So when you turn your grinder on stand to the side of it. Um, should I turn it on when Lisa's filming? She's standing right there. I can't. Um, so anyway, that's just a safety tip so that you don't knock yourself out or worse. So um, I'm going to have Lisa move away, and I'm going to turn it on, and I'm going to test this scissor, grind my scissors up for you, and then a, a piece of tool steel to show you the difference in the sparks. Till mild from a tool. Okay, now watch the sparks from the tool steel. They're feathery, and more on the yellow side. See that? 
That's tool steel with carbon. There's my scissors. And they're more, they're definitely not as fluffy. And they're straighter and a little larger. Do that. Finger it one more time. Big difference. So that, this will take 25 minutes to slow down. <laughs> so that's how you tell the difference between mild and tool steel. Meet you in the other room. So I snapped my tool steel and um, I remembered that you can use the snapped rough surface here as a texture stamp um, after you temper the tool. Otherwise it will just mush up and you'll lose the shape of it. Um, but so I made a little um, texture sample here that Lisa Lisa will put a close-up of for you But we are um, not going to use this for a texture stamp. I want to show you briefly um, What to do now that you've snapped it you want your end nice and square here um, so you can either use the the um, Thing I can never remember the name of this thing <laughs> And you can use this to square your edge um, or just watch my how to get straight metal edges on metal or whatever video. We'll have a link for that too. Um, so you want to square this edge off and make it nice and smooth. So use your steel files or your grinder or your belt sander. And then you want to put a bevel on the edge. And what the bevel is going to do, and you're going to put it on all four corners. If you do a round one, go ahead and bevel all around that too. Um, you want this beveled so that you don't end up with m metal mushrooming over the edge. This end is going to stay softer than the working end of the tool. So um, it will have a tendency to floop. So what we don't want, we don't want it to do that because then little pieces can chip off and maybe fly in our eyes while we're hammering. So you put a little beveled edge on it and it's just, you know, the drag, drag the file. Boy, this is noisy on this stand. And just go ahead and, and put a bevel on it. Now you can use, let me see if I have any good beveled ones here. This one has a better bevel on it. I don't know if you can see it. Um, I usually do this on my bench grinder. So if you have a bench grinder, you can go ahead and bevel the edge on that too. Uh, but if you don't, you can use the files. You don't have to have a bench grinder for this technique. You just need to kneel metal and a file. So um, since this is already annealed, I'm not going to anneal this. I'm going to set it over there. I'm going to show you how to kneel using this short little thing that is probably scrap. Um, so I'll meet you in the at the torch. In the torch would be interesting, but at the torch would be better. <laughs> so you'll need some vice grips to hold this. These are like total wussy ones. Uh, time for a trip to Harbor Freight. Because um, this holds it really securely. You don't want to drop this on your foot or on your floor or anywhere because it's going to be red hot especially with these hot glasses on. These are, have a UV protection. Just found out I have cataracts. So I'm now taking care of my eyes. <laughs> um, anyway, what we're gonna be doing now is heating this to a bright um, red, orange red. And then we are going to, we want it to cool slowly. So we're gonna put it in a medium that's gonna allow it to do so. You metal clay people already have the charcoal coconut charcoal or whatever it is, um, that will work fine. You just bury the red hot um, steel in there and leave it until it's room temperature. You can use clay cat litter, um, brick dust, um, uh, vermiculite, although I don't know if that would cool. Well, it should work. Anything that's going to slow down the cooling temperature. You can even make yourself a little um, uh, box out of fire brick and heat it and then leave it to cool in there. It, the concept is you want it to cool slowly. That's that's the important factor on it. So I'm going to heat this up to a bright cherry red. And you're gonna move the torch around. Ideally you would be doing this in the fire brick, a little a fire a little fire brick kiln, but I don't have any, so this is what I'm doing. And what I'll have to do is, after I kneel this one side, I'm going to have to flip it over and kneel the other side. Because you want the whole piece annealed. 
especially if it's hardened. So I'm going to go ahead and drop it in here. Get my vice grip off. Cover it up. And then I'm going to let it sit in there until it's room temperature. Then I'm going to flip it over and do the other side. As I said, if you had the little kiln box set up, you don't, wouldn't have to do it twice. But I have to. So um, next thing I'm going to show you how to do is temper your tools. Okay?